Good afternoon. I will uh, introduce our speaker in just a moment while uh, uh, attendees are, are, are coming in. Uh, I, my name is Andrew Murtha and I'm the uh, George and Sadie Hyman Professor of China Studies here at uh, Johns Hopkins SICE. And this is the second in our series of uh, studying China from elsewhere. Uh, and it is my genuine uh, and, uh, and, and very, very real pleasure to uh, be able to introduce uh, my good friend uh, and, um, and, and um, kind of standard uh, uh, of excellence in, in, in all things uh, uh, research related, uh, Professor William Hurst. Uh, I'm going to just give a formal introduction, then I'll give a slightly informal one, and then we'll, we'll get to it. Um, but uh, just this series uh, focuses on uh, trying to get the kind of data that we've been uh, used to and uh, have, have basically taken it as an article of faith that we would be able to get kind of into the future uh, on the ground in China. Um, and the recent uh, uh, few past few years and China's uh, tightening up uh, makes that, those types of expectations and assumptions somewhat problematic. Um, and this is particularly uh, uh, the case with uh, um, graduate students and with junior faculty. Um, and uh, so this series uh, is part of an ongoing effort to, uh, on the one hand, reassure, on the other hand, retool uh, that demographic, as well as those of us who are veterans and who need to do things a little bit differently. Um, uh, last semester, we looked at um, uh, uh, Pekingology to ask questions about to what degree um, uh, is, is that useful in uh, the current day. Uh, and this series, which uh, a couple of weeks ago featured uh, Mike Lampton, today Bill Hurst, and later this month, Maggie Lewis and Maria Repnikova, uh, looks at the study of China uh, outside of China. Now, technically, uh, Bill uh, was not looking at China-Indonesian relations, uh, but rather as a kind of a static comparison. Uh, but uh, Bill is uh, enough of a um, of a, uh, a, a field researcher par excellence that uh, he'll be able to uh, square that circle as well as, well as many others. So. Um, let me, now that we have a critical mass and we have our quorum as far as the audience is concerned, let me introduce Bill Hurst. Um, Dr. William Hurst is the Chunghua Professor of Chinese Development in the Department of Politics and International Studies at the University of Cambridge. There he is also the Director of the Center of Development Studies and Deputy Director of the Center for Geopolitics and a Fellow at Wolfson College. Professor Hurst's work mainly focuses on labor politics, contentious politics, political economy, and the politics of law and legal institutions, with a focus on China and on Indonesia. I'll circle back around to that. Uh, Professor Hurst is the author of Ruling Before the Law, The Politics of Legal Regimes in China and Indonesia, which came out in Cambridge University Press in 2018. And The Chinese Worker After Socialism, also Cambridge, uh, in 2009. He is the co-editor of Laid Off Workers in a Worker's State, Unemployment with Chinese Characteristics from Paul Grave Macmillan in 2009, and Local Governance Innovation in China, Experimentation, Diffusion, and Defiance, Rutledge 2015. Uh, he has also published four edited volumes, several dozen articles, chapters, essays, and other shorter works, many of which uh, have explored areas of comparative urban politics, U.S.-China relations, and local politics and governance in rural China, among many, many others. Uh, he is currently at work on a book that explains the politics of land reform, uh, land and land reform, and their long-term implications for state formation and political economy, taking him to mainland China, Taiwan, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Uh, and the time period he's looking at is, uh, you know, a, a thin slice, that is, since 1949. Uh, he's completed field work in each country uh, uh, since uh, uh, 2006, 
I'm not sure if that's a typo, uh, and uh, his research makes extensive use of archival documentary, observational and interview sources and data from those countries that were either unavailable or simply never utilized before. And that is, I think, something that we're going to talk about in terms of opportunities that are out there um, that, uh, 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 that you may not have, have been aware of. Before coming to Cambridge, uh, Bill was an associate professor and professor of political science at Northwestern. Prior to that, he was assistant professor at the University of Toronto and the University of Texas at Austin. He's held fellowships or fixed term appointments at Harvard, the University of Oxford, Bowdoin, and Arlanga University in Indonesia. Uh, Bill completed his PhD at uh, UCAL Berkeley in 2005 uh, after uh, receiving his undergraduate degree from the University of Chicago. Uh, I've known Bill since he was a graduate student uh, and I, there's nobody within this discipline who is a more uh, honest, uh, generous, uh, outspoken, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the kind of person you would want to have uh, in your lifeboat or that you would pick first for your kickball team. Uh, Bill really is, um, uh, embodies uh, the art, the craft, the science of field research. And in my view, he's, uh, if not the best, then he is one of the best field researchers in the business. And I would actually um, uh, bet a fair amount of money uh, that he's uh, the best. So in any case, with that out of the way, um, let me uh, hand the microphone over to Professor William Hurst. Bill, the floor is yours. Great, let me unmute myself. Thank you, thank you so much, Andy, for, for all of your incredibly kind and generous words. It's wonderful, it, it, it's, it's wonderful to hear such things, but it is also a challenge in that now, I know only that I will never possibly live up to the billing. There's no way I can match that um, in real life. So you'll see just how much puffery there really was in those, in those remarks as I continue with, with saying anything. So, I mean, the, the challenge of today's topic is how do we look at China from somewhere else or how do we learn something about China from somewhere else? But let me backtrack just a bit. 20 years ago, 20 plus years ago, I, Andy, many of us, all of us really, were trained to study Chinese politics in a subfield of political science that we call comparative politics. Now, most of the time, that comparative politics part was very small uh, for most people in, that, in those days, at least back in the, the 1990s or even more so in the 1980s. And very often you'd see books that would talk about, you know, country A, and the politics of something, 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 dot, 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 in comparative perspective, right? And what that in comparative perspective meant varied. Sometimes there was really, you know, some discussion of some other cases. Usually it was a chapter at the end, kind of a throwaway chapter. Um, sometimes it was even less than that. Sometimes it was just a few oblique mentions here and there. And then that struck me as, as something. So, you know, we're really comparing anything? Are we really comparativists if we're not actually comparing country A with country B? Then it occurred to me as I was thinking about how to design a dissertation, hmm, maybe we don't have to compare country A with country B. Maybe what we really should be doing is comparing within country A. We can compare region one and region two or time T and time T plus two or whatever it might be. Uh, this kind of subnational comparative analysis. And that was uh, in those days, again, becoming all the rage in places like Latin America and South Asia, right? Lots of people writing about countries like uh, India uh, or even you know, places like Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, et cetera, were getting really into this. Uh, and the, the difference though, with a place like China, is that a lot of those analyses, not all of them, but if I think, for example, about Atul Kohli and his students who worked on Indian politics, they really did look at subnational federal units, Indian states, or in the Latin American context, Mexican states or Brazilian states. And that's fine. They're federal systems. They lend, their, they lend themselves to that very strongly. Um, China's not a federal system. Does it really make sense to compare province A with province B? Are they really separate units in the same way? Are provinces necessarily the right boundaries to be drawing? For some questions, absolutely yes. 
for others, perhaps not. And the question I was interested in at that time, which was how do we explain the origins, uh, process, consequences, and uh, mobilization around uh, massive layoffs from the Chinese state-owned sector, right, between the early 90s and the early 2000s, which amounted to something like 70% of the workforce in that sector. Uh, not quite, 60% of the workforce, about 70 million jobs lost. Um, how do we get at that in a way that explains different patterns across space over this particular time range? The province wasn't the, the salient boundary to draw. Neither was this idea of sort of three belts. A lot of research on Chinese political economy, and again, in those days, but even still today, they'll talk about the coastal provinces, the central provinces, and the inland provinces, right? These three big belts of, of, of China. That's useful for some things. Again, not really for this. Likewise, there's subsequent to my work, actually, within about the last 10 to 12 years, uh, come into fashion this terminology of first, second, and third tier cities, which, well, whatever that really means. It seems to mean different things to different people. Again, not really the salient axis of comparison for this particular set of things. And so when I sat down and I thought about it, I thought really it's political economic regions at the supra provincial level, but that also cut across provincial boundaries in some cases. Um, certain areas of the country, like for example, the Northeast, or what I call the Central Coast, uh, or North Central China, which is, you know, for example, Shanxi, Shanxi, Henan, Shandong, um, at least the non peninsular part of Shandong, um, and little bits of Gansu, um, and also little bits of Inner Mongolia, like Baotou. Right? So if we look at that whole region of North Central China, and then we've got this, this sort of southwestern region that I, in the book, called the Upper Changjiang, um, which is sort of all the cities that were major centers of third front industrialization, but also were large industrial cities from before 1949 uh, in places like Sichuan and Hunan, Hubei, uh, and Chongqing. So what I did then was within each of these places, I tried to pick cities that were representative as much as possible, go to those cities and do as much research as I could, mostly through interviews. And that seemed to work pretty well for me. I was pretty happy with the way it was working while I was doing it. I was pretty happy with the, the, the results that I was able to get from that and what I was able to say, I think, and I hope, about Chinese politics as a whole and how it might stack up with politics in other places, like for example, the Soviet Union or even the United States or the UK and what the regional political economic dynamics in those different contexts might be, particularly around issues of labor and contentious politics, as well as sort of comparative political economy of industrialization and deindustrialization. So I was, I was pretty happy with that, but at the same time, I kind of thought, hmm, that's kind of delimiting, right? It's, it's, it's self-limited in the sense that I still only can look at regions like that in China. In the conclusion of that first book, I kind of had to stop short and say, yeah, you know, maybe the Northeast is like the Urals, and maybe a place like Bensi is like Chelyabinsk or Magnitogorsk, but maybe it's not. I don't really know enough about Russia or the USSR, right? Maybe a place uh, like the uh, Central Coast area uh, is actually like, for example, the East Coast of the United States. But maybe it's not because I don't know enough about the United States to really get into that. So I, I was limited in what I could say when it came to broader scope of generalizability or external validity, as we might call it. And that was at the same moment as I was realizing that was at the same moment that another fortuitous consequence occurred for me, which was that, and this was completely random in the sense that I thought you know, when going to China for field research as a graduate student, I knew there was going to be a lot of downtime. There always is. There's always a ton of time where you can't get into an office. You can't get people to talk to you. You can't get your work done that you set out to do. You're frustrated. You're sort of sitting around. Had to have something to fill the downtime, even just time on trains. Still have nightmares, actually, about two-day train rides from place to place all the time that I was taking in those days. But, you know, what do you do in the train? You know, like talk to people, but then people go to sleep. I don't sleep that well on the train or on any other mode of transit. So what should I do? I should read. And so I brought with me as many books as possible. And I didn't want to keep reading about Chinese politics. I was sick of that. I felt like I'd read what I needed to read of the literature. 
Um, and I was trying to do that all day when I could. So when I didn't do that, I wanted to read something else. And I decided to therefore read as much as I could about the politics of some other place. And I discovered that Indonesia was a country about which not all that many books had been written about its politics. Um, and that was fortunate because in those days there were no eBooks. It was, you carried with you all the books that you wanted to read and I did that in a big box. Um, and I read as many as I could during that time, certainly didn't read everything in Indonesian politics, but as many of the things that I could sort of get my hands on and get through. And I discovered that, you know, there's a lot there. There's a lot that's really interesting, but there's also a lot that hasn't been explored. And interestingly, Indonesian politics, or the analysis of Indonesian politics, suffered from exactly the mirror image kind of pathology that I think Chinese politics did which is that in, again, in those days, and I think even more so now actually, people who look at Chinese politics often don't think about the external validity of the sites they pick. They'll go to one site, they'll go to some hyper local place uh, and they'll say, okay, in this county, I see this and this and this, therefore I can make an argument about roving bandits, stationary bandits, whatever kind of things. Or they get a great big data set and they look at that. But aside from the big data sets, the people are going to particular places and really extracting granular data at close range tend to be less concerned about external validity. And that's true whether they're doing experiments or whether they're doing interviews or archival research, they tended to go to one place, dive deeply into that one place and then try to extrapolate general ideas from that. Indonesian politics was the other way around. Most people never made it out of the capital or if they did, they didn't talk about it. Most people with a couple of notable exceptions, most of the scholars were really only interested in very broad patterns of politics at the central level in Jakarta. And they would make these sort of grand sweeping arguments about the way that not only Indonesian politics, but even politics around the world or certainly in Southeast Asia or in some very broad setting uh, worked based on this, this sort of high level of abstraction analysis or what I thought of compared to China, at least for the study of China as being very high level of abstraction kind of analysis. Analysis. Almost as if the China scholars assumed, because it's China, everyone will care. And so I don't really need to think about building broader theoretical arguments. I'm just going to dive deeply into these granular data. Whereas some of the Indonesian specialists were saying, nobody cares about Indonesia. And I know that. And I'm going to assume that no one really cares about knowing every little bit of things that I could tell you about Indonesia, qua Indonesia. Instead, I'm gonna to try to spin these great big macro arguments that are gonna appeal everywhere, right? Think print capitalism, for example, right? Or any of the other you know, sort of classic arguments, moral economy of peasants um, and so on and so on that come out of not just Indonesia, uh, but Malaysia and, and other parts of Southeast Asia, uh, political analysis. So, you know, I kind of became captivated with that. And when I came back, from the field and I was trying to write up, which is never a fun process, um, but I was trying to write up and I had a little bit of spare time on my hands. I decided, let me think more carefully about this whole Indonesia angle. And it turned out I was very lucky that Berkeley had an Indonesian language program. It's one of very few US universities that does now still and did then. And so I decided, you know, why not? Why not really try to do this? I had a, a classmate who worked on Vietnam and Indonesia who learned Indonesian as part of his training. He said it wasn't that difficult. The teacher was very nice in the, in the language program. So I decided to just do that while writing up. And I spent two years and spent, you know, in the midst of those two years, uh, actually after those two years, uh, an extended summer doing intensive language in, in Sulawesi as well. After which I kind of felt like, okay, I can do this language wise. And so it became a possibility for me to do that looking forward. And then, you know, I've sort of continued to work on, on both Chinese and Indonesian sense, because uh, you never really master a language, you only get less bad at it. But you know, I tried, tried to continue to do that as much as possible in pursuing future research. So once I got that first book done, I was very eager to start really looking comparatively across the two countries. And what I found is that you can do the subnational comparison in different ways and combine it with a cross-national comparison of these two very different countries. And I think it carries a lot of advantages. I think it gets you 
basically the ability to combine a most similar systems design within each country with a most different systems design across them to combine basically Mill's method of difference within the countries with Mill's method of agreement across them. So you're getting at both sort of variation on the X and on the Y uh, and pinning down what really matters uh, and what doesn't uh, in a way that can be controlled across both dimensions uh, such that it is in my view better than just looking inside one country uh, to the extent that that's feasible. There's another aspect to this, and then I'll get into the sort of big picture, broad brushstrokes aspect of it before handing it back over to, to Andy to, to think about questions. Uh, another aspect of this, I think, is actually sort of the professional arc of one's career, which is that if you think of what is the comparative advantage of a graduate student, the comparative advantage of a graduate student is that he or she has time, time to go to a particular place or a small set of places, really spend as much time as needed in that place, delve as deeply as possible into gathering data from that place and about that place, and go in any direction they want and stay in the field for a protracted period after which their field work is done and they'll definitely have enough to come back and write it up. They're not wedded to a specific project quite the same way. They've passed the dissertation perspectives, but they don't have a grant that says they have to write this. They also have one big chunk of time in a way that you never get again, or very seldom do you get that again. You don't get a year or two years to just be in the field and have nothing else no book manuscripts to review, no tenure cases to, to decide on, no students coming after you for guidance. You know, all you have to do when you're a graduate student is sit in the field and do your work. I think every graduate student should take advantage of that and should probably be looking at the most micro aspect of the research that they can. That's their comparative advantage. They can get at the micro data in more detail with greater specificity and greater accuracy than almost anyone else can. So if we think of good research as walking on two legs, one of data, one of theory, the data leg for a graduate student is going to be stronger than anybody else's and they really need to maximize that. And that maybe cuts a little bit against the argument for trying to do big cross-national comparisons as a graduate student. Later in one's career, though, the more you read, the more you spend time in different places, the more you think about different kinds of problems, the more you sort of try to write different kinds of things for different audiences on different topics. And as you watch politics in real time unfold, I mean, you watch politics in real time from the time you become sentient, right? And that's probably why you end up uh, in a... In a undergraduate major in political science or in, a, in graduate school studying politics. But you know, the longer you spend as kind of a professional political scientist looking at politics as it unfolds, the more insight I think you glean about not just how things look now, but how things look in perspective to what you maybe understood a different way 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Um, maybe also about how things look now in this area in comparison with something you've written about in another area or read a lot about in another area. Uh, and so, you know, you can draw, I think, I hope for my own sake, as well as others, maybe slightly better big picture theoretical insights, at least more easily. It feels easier to do that. Maybe you just get more arrogant in doing it. I'm not sure, but at least you, you feel like you can do that better. At the same time, as an old colleague of mine in Texas actually used to say, Comparativists are like outfielders. The legs are the first thing to go. And it's true. You don't get that time in the field ever again, not the same way. And when you do, you're old and it's harder. You're less efficient. Um, it's harder to put up with multi-day train rides. It's harder to put up with buses up and down the mountains when the road is washed out. It's harder to put up with you know, getting sick all the time. Uh, in certain kinds of settings, whatever it might be. And there's only so many times you can have dengue before it stops being funny. Um, you know, you're less tolerant of all these kinds of things. Um, and as that kind of wears on you a bit, doesn't mean you don't go to the field, but it means you're less efficient and you spend less time there. And when you're there, you're still getting the curse of email. 
um, the book manuscripts to review, the students coming with questions, the colleagues who need this or that, uh, the committee that wants you to vote on something. Uh, you never really get ever again the same way that you do in grad school, the sort of tunnel vision singular focus on your own work and on the work specifically of data collection. So the data are never going to be as strong. That data leg hopefully doesn't atrophy to the point where your legs go like an outfielder, but the data leg is going to become, at least in relative terms, weaker than the theory leg. The theory leg hopefully should get stronger or at least more confident, you're more confident on it so that you can really run. Um, and that's why I think this more broad kind of comparative analysis is better to do as one moves into mid-career and beyond. And I think by late in one's career, most people are not doing that much field work. Which is why I have to give real plaudits to those who do. And somebody like Jim Scott, um, who the last time I saw him in person, I believe, was it the last? I think the last time I saw him in person was in India at a conference while he was on his way back from Myanmar where he was doing field work, he's 86 years old. Right. So there, there are older scholars who do serious field work and continue to do so well into the latter part of their career. Most don't. And it's not easy. So as, as field work sort of shrinks back, the theory has to spring forward. That being said, I'll make a then last plea for sort of some big picture aspects of this and then turn it over to questions. Basically, I think, and I wrote about this in an essay about five years ago, which I was inspired to do after sitting on an APSA panel with Andy actually, and looking at some younger scholars work particularly who were trying to do different kinds of comparison and thinking about how do we actually compare China with other countries or other countries with China or other countries amongst themselves? How do we compare countries? What does it really mean? What do we mean when we say we're doing something uh, as a real comparison versus just in comparative perspective the way they used to say 30 or 40 years ago or even 50 years ago? And I think there are really four kinds of comparison uh, that we can, we can sort of narrow in on. The shallowest one, but the one that's also most common and not useless. I did this in my first book when I talked about Chelyabinsk uh, and Magnitogorsk being like, like Ben C or Harbin uh, or, or various other parallels like that or Chicago being like uh, uh, Chongqing to some extent. The the, 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 the type of comparison that I'm talking about here is what I would call the shadow comparison. I didn't do research in the Urals. I didn't do research in the Great Lakes, although I'd lived there before I wrote that. Uh, I didn't live in the Urals, in the Great Lakes, I mean. Um, and what I did was basically try to take something that I knew in very broad terms or that I studied in very shallow secondary kind of literature terms and just make an allusion to it and say, there's a parallel here that looks at least intriguing to me. It's worth further study. It's worth developing. It's worth really delving into. It's worth doing this comparison, I think. And I still think that about those particular comparisons I tried to draw, but I'm not the one to do it. It's not my work. It's not work I can really do, but I'm gonna bring it up to suggest it to others. And I'm gonna bring it up also to try to show what the limits of external validity might be or might not be of what, I, what I've already specified in the Chinese context. So that's the shadow comparison. And it's very, very, very common. Uh, that is the most common sort of comparative illusion, I would say, rather than comparative analysis. Illusion with an A, not I. Um, it's not fake. It's just you know, sort of an aside saying, look over here, there's also something interesting. The second kind of comparison uh, that's a little bit deeper that is rarer but can be very useful uh, is what I would call the mirror comparison. Now, the mirror case is a case that is fairly similar, kind of an, it's like, like one of those cases I just mentioned uh, in such an analysis, but is one that plays a consistent role drawn through in a, in a sort of one core thread throughout your, your work so that you're constantly kind of referring back against that case. But it's a case that you haven't actually studied in that much detail and that you're not going to sort of bring up brand new data about in a meaningful way or really build your theory around. There's more to say, you know, I've got this idea, I've got these, these theories that I've built from this particular case, and here's another case or a couple of cases that I'm gonna go back to and refer to again and again to kind of show what the similarity is. Uh, or the difference or, or what I can glean from sort of looking at those two next to each other. 
The third kind of comparison is the one that I think Andy alluded to in some of his earliest remarks uh, on this, uh, not earliest, but earlier remarks when he was introducing me and talking about the, the overall theme of, of the discussion, and that I think really is a lot of what the, the, the uh, series is kind of framed around, at least in, in its titling, which is what I would call the, the partner comparison. Uh, which is when you look at country A and how it deals with country B, or what do I learn being in country B about country A? That would be, for example, a study of China-Indonesia relations or um, of, say, U.S.-China relations or whatever it might be, right, where we're actually looking from another place back at China uh, or sitting in China looking at how it deals with another place. Um, so that's, you know, the partner comparison. That's wonderful but it's limited in the subject matter that we can study. It's very limited in terms of what we really glean in knowing about country A while we're sitting in country B, but it also is, is sort of focused fairly narrowly on the relationships between states. So it's, it's, I think, I would argue, essential for understanding international relations in any way more nuanced than some of the very broad, um, theories or, or, or sort of billiard ball theories, for lack of a better term, that are often batted around or very abstract, almost abstruse theories of IR. If we really want to understand how state A and state B interact uh, and relate to each other, we have to know about their domestic politics and what their processes of sort of thinking about one another are and how they make policy in relationship to each other. So that's the partner comparison. And the very last one is the one I like the best. I call it the apples comparison because you're comparing apples to apples that means you've got to go and do equivalent data collection in the two countries or three or four, however many countries you're going to add. That has a tremendous cost of time in that you have to actually train up on area studies and language and history and everything else for both country A and country B. And you have to spend the time on the ground in the field in both countries to write it up. But I think if you can do it, there's lots and lots of potential rewards. And so I would make a pitch for that, particularly heading into sort of post-dissertation research, uh, but also with the caveat that in order to do that really well, I think that you have to start training for that even before you finish the dissertation. The one final remark I'll make, and then I really will turn it over for questions, is that some of what we're talking about um, when we talk about studying China from another place is getting access to data. Andy also alluded to this in his comments. So I just wanted to touch on this very briefly. It is true. It's not getting easier to do field work in China. We all know that we've all experienced it. I actually would argue and have argued quite strongly that the trend began not in 2015 or 2017. It began around 2007. Uh, I saw that quite sharply uh, with the aftermath, well, the run-up to, really, uh, the 17th Party Congress, right? So after the 16th Party Congress, we didn't really see this. In the run-up to the 17th Party Congress in late 2007, we did. We saw a strong crackdown uh, and a strong crackdown on sort of many areas of intellectual activity and, and uh, scholarly life any kinds of data collection, what you could and couldn't do. It wasn't that everything suddenly closed down 100%, but it became noticeably and significantly harder to do almost anything once we got sort of into mid-2007. And I expected that this would relax again after the Party Congress, but it didn't. It just kept tightening. And it tightened and tightened and tightened. And then, of course, the financial crisis, the Olympics, the aftermath of the Olympics, all of what happened in Chongqing uh, around uh, the power struggle just before uh, Xi Jinping came into office, and then everything that's been pushed by Xi Jinping's agenda of essentially trying to create a more vibrant, coherent, uh, and powerful state uh, rooted in a kind of ideological um, mobilization uh, of society in the sense of positive power and inspiration of individuals by the state and what it articulates as, it, as its ideology. All of that has made it tremendously more difficult to the point where in about 2017, I kind of had this revelation of saying, you know, it is very difficult for me individually to continue doing the sort of research that 
I'm hoping still to do in mainland China right now, right? I really have kind of exhausted the well of what I could do for this land project um, that I was working on at the time and continue to work on in the mainland. And my immediate response was, let me see what else is out there from in terms of mainland sources, because I was also looking in Taiwan for Taiwan sources. Let me see what else is out there in other places. And I found a treasure trove of fantastic archival materials in Hong Kong in a library that was closed down at the end of 2019 um, and now has been permanently closed. Uh, and Hong Kong, of course, has become a much more challenging environment in which to work. And then we add on top of that COVID uh, and what's going on with COVID. So I think this is a terrible time to be a graduate student or to be researching in China or in any country. Uh, I think, you know, I have students in the field right now who were in the field before COVID and stayed into it. I have students who couldn't get to the field at the beginning of COVID and went in the middle and are still there in some cases. Some who went and came back, they, they're managing with difficulty and with limitations and they could be and would be doing so much more than they're able to do now, but for these restrictions around COVID. And I strongly suspect that those restrictions will continue in both China, mainland China and Hong Kong uh, until about a year from now. Uh, after the Liang Hui of 2023 is when I would predict we'll start to see some relaxation. But even with that, we're going to have these problems of data availability and accessibility and further and further restrictions, I think, on fieldwork activity of any kind. So it behooves us to think creatively. And we can think creatively about looking online and looking uh, for sort of scraping of websites and things like that looking for quantitative sources that may be available somewhere else, looking at secondary sources and documents. But I think part of what we miss, and this is where, where Andy also hit on it, and this will be the last thing that I say, I really promise that now. Um, what we miss sometimes in our rush to find something specific or something new is that which was sitting sort of under us, but not yet used. So you can always find something. Um, I think that that's sitting there in plain sight if you look for it um, in terms of data sources. So, you know, I've, I've said this both in, in orally and, and in writing a few times, you know, fieldwork is not a classical recital. Fieldwork is a jazz performance and you have to be able to spot the good opportunity and know how to improvise. Um, and you have to know when not to do it when there's something that's no good. And it's hard to teach that and it's hard to learn that in a systematic way. You just kind of have to acquire that sensibility so that you know you don't go running down too many uh, blind alleys or, or follow, chasing too many wild geese. Uh, but at the same time, you're able to think on your feet and you're able to adjust, you're able to see, hey, there's this huge pile of data sitting there, nobody's touching it. And maybe it doesn't even turn into your actual dissertation or your book, but it might be a useful side article. And I'll give you just two quick examples from my own experience. When I was start, just starting out in the field as a graduate student, I was looking around, I was really trying to look for workers and workers protests. And at the beginning, I was having difficulty. I was having great difficulty getting workers to talk to me. A lot of people were suspicious, you know, who is this foreign grad student? Why should I talk to him? I was having trouble sort of figuring out where do I look for laid off workers to speak to? How am I ever gonna get into factories to talk to factory managers? And then I realized part of the issue I was having around, having in getting around cities, just physically getting around, is that I kept running into protests. And I kept running into you know, people blocking the road, and couldn't get through. I said, Who's blocking the road? These are all pensioners. They're all old people, right? Who are being denied their pensions. And so it occurred to me, why don't I talk to some of these people and figure out what's going on? Maybe there's a story to be told there. Maybe there's something that isn't actually gonna go in the dissertation or in the book, but that might inform my overall thinking about it and provide a segue to do a, a sort of a side article. And that's what I ended up doing. Another story about that is I was desperately in Indonesia in 2010, looking for court records, trying to get access into court archives to go and sort of mine the, the files that were there and go through them very carefully and, and pull out of uh, those cases every, aspect of useful data that I could, and I was having trouble getting access. And when I did get access to, to one significant court in a big city, 
Um, basically, the, the archive was in terrible disarray. It was very hard for me to find anything. And the manager of the archive kept not showing up. It was very hard just to, to get in and, and actually sit down and do the work inside the, the court archive. And so eventually I said to the, to the manager of the archive, I said, look, you know, I'm going to come back in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, let's see if we can get things sorted out before then of how this is going to work. Um, we'll see what we can do. And eventually it did end up working in a couple of weeks. But then I thought, you know, what am I going to do now? And I was talking to some sort of various people, a law professor actually, and a young lawyer, who were telling me about these ad hoc courts at one point, ad hoc courts of different kinds. And then I started reading about ad hoc courts of industrial relations. I thought, oh, that's interesting, you know, ad hoc courts of industrial relations. So I read more about those. I thought, well, yeah, I've studied labor before. There's something interesting there. Then I realized the city I was in had a court of industrial relations. So I just went there figured out where it was. It was on the outskirts of the city, actually, in an industrial area, in this sort of broken down building in a, in a back alley. It wasn't, wasn't very fancy, but it was new. And when I showed up there, they said, oh, what would you like? You know, why, why are you here? You know, do you have business in the court? I said, no, I'm just really interested. You know, do you have any information? Do you have any, any archives, any kind of case records I can see? They're like, yeah, we've got it all. Ever since we opened, we have it all right here. Take a look. So I spent two weeks sitting there reading all their cases. And again, that turned into an article that was not part of the book, um, was not directly related on what it was, but it was one of those good opportunities for improvisation. And I think if we look for those, those data were not secret, they weren't hidden in either case, right? This was not something that I had to get some special favor or special access to get at. These were things that no one had bothered to look at, including me, didn't bother to look at it, right? Um, until I saw that something else wasn't working and then I saw here, well, yeah, I could look there. There might be something. Let's give it a shot. And it turns out there was, even though it didn't lead to actually part of the book. In both cases, it did produce articles uh, that I was very happy about because nobody else was writing about that at those times. Still nobody's writing about industrial relations courts in Indonesia. But a bunch of people wrote about pensions afterwards in, in China and the protests around them. And then, you know, I think that article could contribute in some ways to that literature. So think carefully, I guess, about data that are hiding and maybe slightly tangential areas of your topic uh, or in sources that you wouldn't have looked for them, especially when you're stuck and unable to get at the source you really want. And that includes when you're not in the focus country. You know, if you're not in China, you're somewhere else, you're looking for data, whatever it is you're trying to get in China, from China, about China, but you're not getting it. There's probably something else sitting right there that no one else has bothered to look at. And I could give you other stories of that as well, if you like. But let me stop there. I've already talked far too long, much longer than I promised. Let me turn it back to Andy for questions. Thanks so much, Bill. Uh, I could listen to that all afternoon and all evening long. Um, there's just uh, so many uh, places where we can jump off. Uh, before I do that, let me just make a, a, a quick announcement, uh, which I should have done uh, at the beginning, which is if people have questions, please uh, write them up in the Q&A and I will get to them uh, as I can uh, while I'm also um, uh, riffing on, on um, on, on what uh, Bill has uh, spoken about and, you know, so, and, and my own questions. Um, so let me, let me actually start, if you, uh, Bill, I, let's, let's just get into conversation. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, and I'm gonna embarrass you again, Bill, but um, you know, one of the reasons why I uh, studied uh, Khmer language um, in, uh, you know, when I was already a tenured professor, um, was uh, because I was really interested in doing a China-Cambodia comparison. Uh, the reason why I thought it was actually feasible uh, is because I know that Bill had already done that with the uh, Bahasa Indonesia. And uh, I was, you know, and, and so, you know, uh, Bill, you are, uh, you know, you, you were a bad influence on me. Uh, in any case, let's, uh, let's, let's get uh, uh, into it. Um, let me start on a very small point, but, um, uh, you know, and it's really one of the ones that you ended with, um, you know, this idea of uncovering what hasn't been looked at, but which is there in, you know, in plain sight. Um, and let me just add to that a little bit as well, uh, uh, which is to say, um, 
when I was in the Cambodian National Archives uh, doing work on trying to find out what China was doing in Cambodia during the Khmer Rouge period, um, one of the things that was particularly helpful to me was finding the basically the bills of lading and shipping logs of, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Cambodian imports and exports. Um, and what was funny is as I, as I would talk to uh, colleagues, but also some friends of mine, you know, when I was at Cornell, who were at Cornell, uh, they'd actually look through those same materials mm. 10, 15 years prior when they were working as research assistants mm -hmm. for, in this case, Ben Kiernan. Um, but he used the materials in a very different way. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it is it, just the fact that somebody has gone through it already uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's been, you know, picked, picked all the way through. And so I, I think that just adds to, you know, to, you know, the point that you were making, Bill. Um, but let me, what I'd really like to do is kind of start, <laughs> start with a kind of a more pessimistic uh, uh, um, uh, chain of, uh, you know, of observations, and hopefully that'll kind of push us towards an arc of optimism towards the end rather than the other way around. I want people to walk away here uh, from here inspired. Okay. <laughs> if, if they're, you know, if the data it's so, uh, so, so show. Um, so I think that one of the points that you made uh, uh, that really uh, jumped out at me is the fact that um, this trend of closing up began not in 2012, but five years prior in, in, 20, in, in 2007. And that was very, very much my experience as well. You can almost, you know, you could, you could almost sense that, you know, the air had somehow changed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and, and the, that also came uh, right after probably the, the most open China had ever been. You know, allowing, not, at least uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, at least in the, in the, in, in uh, you know, since 1949, yeah. for foreign researchers. Uh, at least that was my experience. Yeah. And just in terms of access, in terms of people being able to, you know, yeah. able and willing to talk. And then, you know, our own preoccupations about uh, protecting our, mm -hmm. you know, our interlocutors, you know, that those were all, you know, those are always uh, fine, fine tuned. But you got the sense that um, it, you know, the, you didn't, it, it didn't seem that that would be something that uh, one really had to worry about just in kind of a worst case. Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden things really did start to change palpably and, ta and tangi uh, tangibly. Is there a way, do you think, that we can, uh, you know, for people who had been doing research at that time and since that time, uh, are there lessons learned, the, you know, half measures that we had to take, you know, as things were closing up that might still be useful now that it's closed up to the extent that it has, or is it better to really look at this as, you know, a door shutting rather than one uh, uh, gradually closing? That's, that's a really, really interesting question to think about. I'm, heartened in a way by the fact that you share the same perception because a lot of people for a lot of people that falls flat when i say that it, i felt like it started changing in 2007 like, really i don't know but yeah you know, I, I think i think that's very much true i felt it because i was going to some of the same places that i've been going to since early 2006 2006 2007 i was in a postdoc so i was almost like extended grad school time i had writing time in Oxford, where I was at the time. And then I also had these protracted periods where I could go to the field and I had enough funding to get myself to the field, not a ton of funding, but plenty to go to the field and do the research I really wanted to do. And I was going mostly to Sichuan and Jiangxi provinces, different localities and big cities, small towns, rural areas across those two provinces. But both of those provinces are kind of out of the way places compared to you know, Beijing, Shanghai, wherever else. Uh, Jiangxi much more out of the way than, than Sichuan in a lot of in a lot of respects. But there are also places that are not known as being particularly liberal or freewheeling to start with. After a little bit of rapport building, though, I find that you can actually get a lot done in such places, at least you could back in those days. And I think you're right. We had this kind of a golden age 
from about 1995 to about 2005, I would pin it and say, you know, in that 10 year period, which happens to be the 10 year period, I was in grad school and doing all that field work, which is great for me in that experience. I look back on it sort of wistfully uh, in that it was phenomenal to have the opportunity to do all those things. And then unfortunately I got to see that opportunity really kind of restricted and, and closed down in a significant way, starting from 2007. The other big turning point I saw was right when I got really interested in more archival kind of work around 2013, because for a couple of years, I wasn't going to the field as much sort of 2010, 11. I didn't make it back so often during those years. And then I started going back some more later, end of 2012, beginning of 2013. Then in summer 2013, I was going around different archives, different provincial level archives in Sichuan and Jiangxi and a bunch of other places. And I was finding it kind of difficult, pretty difficult actually, quite difficult. Um, it was very hard to get, you know, the Jia Shao Xin that I needed from different units. And then even when I got it, I could get a Jia Shao Xin from the provincial government and they still wouldn't let me into the provincial archive. I, I did in Sichuan, I should have and and they then they let me in but then they only let me look at the digital catalog and the digital catalog was missing everything from after 1949 and when i got away with looking at the hard copy catalog that i did before they told me you can only look at the digital catalog there were shelves and shelves of materials from after 1949 including a lot of stuff that i found they wouldn't let me see it you know, more and more and more and more restricted um everything became then I was talking to some historians, friends of mine who are historians that I happened to run into you know, from foreign universities. Um, I happened to run into them in different places in China that year uh, as I was sort of going around looking for archives. And they said their experience was even worse. Archives where they've been working for a decade, two decades, three decades, suddenly they couldn't access them at all. Like zero uh, ability to access or everything gone or everything being quote unquote digitized, but then just disappearing from any kind of record or, or, or uh, accessible uh, venue. That I think has only gotten worse since 2013, 14. I think it's gotten you know, substantially worse uh, up again, at least until about 2017, when I personally kind of gave up trying at least for the time being to find those kinds of things. So I feel like the combination of that and the combination of sort of the chilling of political and social discourse such that it's very hard to do interviews carefully and well in a way that people are comfortable with and, and genuinely protected and safe right now. It, it's just a huge challenge. Like, as I said, it's not impossible. I mean, I have had students in the field the past several years. It, it is not, there are people doing it. It's particularly impossible right now if you don't have a Chinese passport. It's very, very hard to get into China at all. Uh, there are no visas being issued. It's very hard to get there. Even with a Chinese passport, there's all kinds of restrictions and problems and roadblocks. And then the three weeks of quarantine. And then some people are reporting to me that they go to another city, they have to quarantine again. So the amount of time you spend in quarantine can just really add up. You know, if you've got three months to do something and you're going to four different places, you could spend most of that time in quarantine and not actually get most of your, your work done at all. And quarantine's expensive, you gotta stay in the hotel, all, all of those negative things of quarantine. But I feel like there's lots and lots and lots of stuff closing. What's opening? What can we do in terms of half measures? I think what we need to look for in that sense is if I contrast my two research experiences around different topics where I was trying to do things that weren't just archives, because the land stuff is almost completely archives. Um, and archives have their own sort of special issues. But if I look at the law stuff versus the labor stuff uh, from earlier iterations of work, you can't study law unless you can go to the court. You're not going to learn about law from talking to a worker in the street. You have to talk to the judge or the lawyer or the procurator, right? Or the police officer, even the investigator. Um, labor, you can learn a lot by talking to people in much less official settings. You can learn a lot by talking to workers wherever they're comfortable, at home, in a cafe or a restaurant, um, in the street, literally. Um, you, know, you can learn a lot from just talking to people who may not be in a specific, more rarefied realm of, of professional activity or, or political status. 
uh, who might be hard to access. And so, you know, I never felt stymied in looking at labor the way that I did sometimes when looking at law. And I think if we look at those slightly less, not less formal, but less institutionalized kinds of questions, topics, and contexts, there might be some more openings here and there. So we don't have to wait outside the door of the court or beg to see the judge or wait until the lawyer will talk to you. You have things you can do. There's people you can talk to. There's things you can look at. There's data you can gather that don't depend on that sort of narrow channel of specific access. Thanks, Bill. I mean, I think credible proxies are really, really, really important. Um, uh, when I was doing my dissertation research in China, I found foreign lawyers to be particular, and Chinese lawyers, to be particularly um, uh, uh, helpful because they were sit, uh, particularly foreign ones were sitting around. They couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. You know, so you have really smart people that, by virtue of being in China for a very long time, you know, with lots of time yeah. on their hands. Um, you know, another thing, uh, Bill, that I was thinking about when, when you were talking about archival work is that mm -hmm. now there's a lot of uh, uh, materials from China that's outside of China. I and mean, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, Berkeley, for example, you know, that, that, that magnificent, well, it's not quite new anymore, but uh, new-ish library, you know, with, um, you know, yeah. with uh, kind of local gazetteers and, uh, you know, and, and just all the sorts of The also is, is yeah. particularly good there. And, and that library, by the way, is open to anybody. Right. I went there the last time I was in town because I had a spare day and nothing to do. And I just looked it up and I realized you, know, you can't borrow books, but you, anyone can walk in and use right. the collections. You don't need an ID or anything. And there's a bunch of libraries like that. So The yeah. other thing that's amazing that's outside China now, there are these white bound volumes, I forget what they're called, but they're these compilations of documents that I don't know where they came from or why or how, but they're compilations of documents from, broadly speaking, the Mao era through the 1980s. And they appeared in several libraries around the world. Um, I don't know, I don't remember the name of the series, I'd have to look it up or, or or you can check into it, but they're, they're around in, in different places and it doesn't seem like anybody's really looking through them systematically. There are varying quality and interest, but there's a lot. So there's a lot of different things like that or the old Red Guard documents that are on microfiche in places like Berkeley and Stanford that no one is bothering to look at now, I don't think. Andrew Walder is probably watching this. He's going to scream at me for neglecting his, his work on, on Red Guards that he's been doing recently. But um, tons of people were looking at that stuff in the 70s mm -hmm. and into the early 80s. And my sense is that very few people are really combing through that now. And there's just tons of stuff there that could be used, I'm sure. Um, and, and we're not doing that. So if we, if we pick our topics carefully and we kind of look for sources creatively, yeah, there's a lot we can still do. Thanks. That's, uh, that actually uh, is, is on the optimistic side, um, uh, which, which, which is good to hear. Um, you know, one of the other things that I was, you know, when you were talking about mirror cases in, uh, in particular, one, uh, an, an observation I had is, you know, it almost seems like there you, you essentially become an area specialist in, you know, two or more areas, you know, so you become a more diffuse area specialist, but the outcome is having uh, more expertise on something that is not area specific, but, but 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 functionally specific because you know you're you know you're comparing that same thing uh in in two or more areas um and it led me to the question of how do you and and some people have asked this question as well which is how do you think this this lack of access is going to shape uh the kind of scholarship uh that is you know that, that's going to emerge um as well as opportunities uh, and um, and incentives, uh, not only for uh, 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 you know young young uh, graduate students and young scholars, uh, but also of the departments that uh, you know that um, uh, that they work within. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it, are we, for example, likely to see more survey-based stuff because you know you can do internet scraping a lot easier than you can. Uh, you know, some, some other, you know, soaking or soaking and poking and, you know, uh, you know, dog patch county, you know, uh, wherever province. So um, do you have any thoughts on that, Bill? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I think, hmm, 
this idea of, I think, Apple comparisons or what you're thinking of more than mirrors, right? So the actual way you're really doing field work in both places and this kind of thing. I think that's, you're right. You kind of have to train as an area specialist in more than one area and you do risk becoming too diffuse. That's why I think it's better to do that, not necessarily for a dissertation, because you're never going to have that data comparative advantage that you would as a graduate student, and you're certainly not going to have it in both of two very different contexts at the same time, right? There's only so many plates when one, one can really keep spinning. But I think, you know, there's, there's this issue of sort of, uh, what does that mean in terms of incentives? I, I would hope that, and this is a sort of more cynical way of looking at this kind of, of uh, cross-national comparison, which is that if you only work in China and on China, you're sort of susceptible to being shut out in a way that, you know, if you can't get the data that you need, you're very, very constrained uh, and undermined in terms of what you can really do uh, in that particular place um, because you can't get there or you can't get what you need from it. If you do the kind of Apple comparisons that I, I like to think about, and you've got another country you can go to, or a couple other countries you can go to, or, or other parts of the world even, uh, that have nothing to do with China, if China is where the problem is, or if it's in the other place, a problem of access or, or data availability or political stability, whatever it might be, you can go to China during that time. And, and you can kind of hedge, in a way, against the risk of being locked out or being unable to access data. Uh, and that's a kind of cynical way of looking at it. In terms of departments, and their incentives, I'm honestly very worried about our discipline in this respect, which is that I feel like what we're experiencing now is quite similar to what the Japan field experienced in the late 1990s, which is that, you know, after the lost decade really set in and after the post-94 electoral reforms, no one cared very much at the department level or the institutional level, and I think they still don't, about Japanese domestic politics or political economy. I think they kind of stopped caring. And they started caring at least for a while, and I worry that they don't even really care about this anymore with respect to Japan as much as they should. Uh, many departments stopped caring even about international relations because the first shift was away from domestic politics and political economy to international relations. And then it's sort of, we don't really care about Japan. And you know, ridiculous as that sounds, right? The third largest economy in the world, uh, major country in Northeast Asia, major military power, extraordinarily important trading partner of the US and other countries. Many departments just don't care about Japan. I think China's sort of on the same path. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, lots of people cared about Chinese domestic politics, Chinese political economy. Now I feel like most departments just don't anymore. They really only care about IR. Uh, you know, Chinese foreign policy, China's place in the world, China's relations with whatever country, the China threat, quote unquote, you know, China destabilizing world, world order, whatever formulation we want to put of it. Uh, and I think that that is unfortunately perhaps a stepping stone from caring deeply about China area studies, comparative politics, political economy to not caring at all about China. I worry that that's the next step, but I hope I'm wrong. Yeah, I hope you're wrong too, but unfortunately, um, I, I wouldn't bet against you. Um, you know, certainly where, you know, in the town where I, I uh, make my, my residence, um, it's very much uh, kind of the overwhelming narrative is, you know, is, is that last one that you pointed to. Um, What's interesting is that when you talk to policy professionals, um, you know, whether in the government or, but in my experience, particularly in the military, you know, as soon as you start talking about domestic politics in China, their eyes light up because they, it's just not something they are exposed to. Um, yeah. So it is, you know, there's, I, I think there's hunger there, uh, but I think it's overwhelmed with, you know, by, by, by this, um, the, the, this focus, this IR based focus. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is just in the interest of time, I'm going to move to sure. some of the questions, uh, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, I'm not going to sure. necessarily Absolutely. go in order. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some of these are a little bit more, um, kind of how to questions mm -hmm. than others, sure. but you know, we have, um, I, I should say that we have people, uh, tuning in from as far away as Turkey and Australia. So, wow. uh, yeah, so we're, uh, Turkey is even later than here. Australia is tomorrow. So. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. 
depends where, but Turkey, I think, is two hours ahead of here. So it's midnight in Turkey. So maybe, maybe take the Turkish first. first if they're, they're up the I, I, that person uh, just thanked us for the program. So Oh, okay. Then, okay. Sure. Yes, I, I would certainly uh, uh, put him at the front of the line. Okay. So uh, one question I, uh, that, that came up, Bill, is uh, what are your thoughts about hiring research assistants to conduct interviews, collect data in a, you know, in a second or third or fourth country? Uh, given the extreme time commitment to train up in another country, is this a viable option? So that's, you know, that, mm. that question is about, you know, perhaps uh, apples to apples. Um, obviously, it, it, uh, uh, it limits the opportunity to be surprised by something in the field, which, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I want to yeah. also underscores uh, what you had said, because that is also something that's extremely important to um, uh, 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 developing one's, one's work there. And is this a second best option in a moment of narrowing access? And, and maybe what I'll do is I'll uh, attach another question to that bill, which is mm -hmm. to say, forget about second, third, and fourth countries. Uh, what about China? Uh, you know, how, how should we feel about uh, uh, um, deputizing uh, Confederates in China? Mm -hmm. um, good questions, both. Uh, I think that there's really two ways to approach this that can be viable. Um, I've never done the kind of research where, you know, you hire a team of assistants to go out and gather all the data for you. I, I, I don't know how fruitful that would be. I think that that's more what I'd associate with enumerators in a survey, you know, somebody going out with a questionnaire and a checkbox to kind of go through and fill in the survey, which, which is how surveys are always done. Uh, and that's, that's all right. Um, I don't think it's really a good strategy for the kind of give and take, in-depth, more open-ended field work that, that, that I was talking about in most of what I had to say or that, that I think we we're mostly talking about in, in our exchange. Um, that being said, the one time I ever did use a research assistant really at all was in China. Um, I did hire an undergraduate student at Beida when I was there uh, to comb through the library and look for articles about my general research topic in major national newspapers, which at the time were not in an online database, right? And Beida Library had all of them. And this was an uncontroversial thing to do. And so I hired a student and I asked her to go through. I showed her how to do it and where the newspapers were. She was flabbergasted at the Workers Daily uh, papers from the Cultural Revolution era, which they had sitting out on the shelf. She couldn't believe they were real. Um, you know, all these things with uh, Mao and, and the sky and, and statements around that. And she, she had no um, conception that this was actually a real thing uh, and was shocked to see it. But she did a very good job, went through, found all the articles about Xia uh, Gang from the you know, 1980s and 90s, which is what I was looking for, uh, from things like Gong Ren Zhibao and, and other you know, national level newspapers. And you know, I used some of that in the dissertation and, and afterwards and thanked her for it, paid her for it. And, you know, had a nice chat and uh, I gave her some advice on how to apply to graduate programs in, in the U.S. and so on. And, and that was it. That was the extent of the kind of research assistant relationship. Um, other than that, I've never really used a research assistant. Um, actually, that's not true. I have in Indonesia too. Uh, and the way that I used research assistants there similarly was to hire some students, mainly literally to help me get around to some places in certain provinces uh, to go and rent a car and drive because I couldn't rent a car with a foreign driver's license uh, and drive out to whatever place. Um, I asked them in some cases to gather other data while in the court, you know, from the case registers and things like that. They actually didn't do it or they did it very, very inefficiently to the point where they didn't get it done such that it would have been useful to me. And in one case, they did gather a whole bunch of case files and then nobody could figure out how to get those scanned and I couldn't carry them when I left. So I ended up not taking them or using them. So, so that kind of didn't go anywhere. But those are really the only times I've used research assistants that way. I would be really wary of trying to do that in a third or fourth country where I don't know the context, I don't have the contacts, and I don't know really how to go about this very well. Uh, and so I, I think that the diminishing returns will be reached very rapidly in that situation. Um, what I do think is also a fruitful channel, though, a sort of second fruitful channel, is co-authoring with researchers in the quote-unquote host country. So I've done some of that, 
right? They're graduate students and, and colleagues both, for example, working in China, you know, Chinese scholars working at Chinese institutions who are gathering phenomenal data, really interesting data um, that, you know, I think is really exciting and they do too. And they're writing about it. And then in some cases they've shared some of those data with me uh, and we've sat together and thought about it and said, well, you know, yeah, you guys have already written this up in this one way. I would write this up in a different way. If I, if they were my data, here's what I'm thinking. Does that make any sense to you? And they said, well, yeah, kind of, but you're wrong on some of these points. And, and let, let, let's talk about that and sort of hash it out. And that worked actually pretty well. We were able to do that in a couple of cases and come up with a, a set of arguments we were really happy with. Um, and then I did try to gather some other data and contribute that and certainly all the secondary sources and you know, a lot of the, the, the writing and, and the editing and the back and forth with journals. But it led to an article or two that I was really happy with that I wouldn't have been able to do on my own uh, because I didn't have those data, I didn't have the grant, I didn't have all that going on. And there were researchers who were generous enough and interested enough to share that. And I think that that's all to the good, but that's not a research assistant relationship. That's more, I learned from colleagues who gathered data that I couldn't or didn't have the opportunity to, and then who were willing to share and talk about it and, and think about the ideas I had in a, in a generous and helpful way uh, and work together. And, you know, and of course we're co-authors on those articles, not, you know, it's not that so-and-so gathered the data and I paid them. Right. So I think it's a very different relationship from a research assistant relationship. And I would even say with graduate students, that's usually certainly the way I would work. And the way I have generally is if, if we have a project, we've talked about it, I tell the student, please go out and gather these data because it would be interesting if you can. Either they write it up themselves or if they're going to write it up, if I'm going to write it up, they're certainly a co-author. And, you know, I think it's important to be careful around that, that, you know, even more important than the payment to a research assistant often is that co-authorship, particularly right. if they're your graduate right. student. Yeah, and I think, you know, as, as, you know, as we kind of move up in our careers, I think it's, um, you know, contingent upon us to be generous uh, that way. Um, the, uh, so one kind of one related question uh, that, that's also come up is, what about networks? You know, now obviously if, if you can't get into China, but even if you do, but you're yeah. constrained, uh, in your, you know, in your opinion, how do you think that could or would likely play out? Understanding that there's a number of different ways in which it can. I don't really understand that question. Networks of what sort? So just if you had pre-existing networks of, of, of people, you know, people that, um, you know, would the, the existence of that network in the absence of, you know, uh, for example, a Jie Xiaoxin, uh, you know, would, you know, would that? Sure, it definitely can help. Um, I mean, certainly if you want to do research in courts, I can tell you that a lot of the older judges and therefore you know, sort of court presidents even uh, served in the military because the, the, the older form of recruitment into the judicial bureaucracy was usually via the military. And so people who served in the same military units are really, really good networks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somebody that served for 10 years in the same, same platoon with somebody else, when they get both to be court presidents can be very useful in talking to each other. One's the court president, the other's the, the head of the Jian Chai Yuan. And then you can, I mean, so in that sense, yes, not so, and these are not my close friends in any of those cases, but you know, they're close friends with each other and they have a very strong, dense and, and, and tight network amongst themselves. The same, for example, with workers actually earlier on in my own research. I mean, if you get talking to one worker who's worked on the same shop floor with somebody else for their whole career and then their, their fathers did too, in some cases, and then some of these factories, they've lived their whole life in the same unit, that's a very dense network. And if you can tap into that network, even though they're not, I didn't live my life in that unit. I didn't work in there, but I know one of those people, then you can open up the network that way. In terms of pre-existing friendship networks or other networks, if you're lucky enough to have that, um, by all means, I would say tap that. I think those are much more common in China among people who grew up in China, 
rather than those who are coming in purely from the outside. And you're much less likely to have a really dense, tight network of that sort if you didn't grow up there. Uh, and if you did, the only thing I would say is be very careful because given the sensitivities around a lot of research, particularly about politics and particularly these days, it's very easy to put your entire network at risk right. um, of, of all kinds of difficulties and problems if you're not cautious about sort of what you ask and what you do and, you know, sort of the ways in which you engage different people in different roles. Yeah, I mean, that's really, we can't, I don't think we can stress that point enough. Um, certainly the networks in the environmental activism uh, uh, demographic um, you know, was, was uh, quite uh, insular, so that if you got the trust of yep. um, kind of one key person there, you know, you pretty much, you know, had, uh, you know, had, had kind of open access. Yeah. I'm going to, so a couple of the questions, I'm going to kind of rephrase them. Uh, um, and I'm going to kind of put you on the spot because it's, uh, it's also a question that one of my students asked me uh, hmm. yesterday and uh, it still kind of haunts me. And I hope I gave the right answer, which is this. Um, if we are at the front end of a desire to study China, does it make more sense for us to, air, you know, to, to, to kind of hedge our bets and go somewhere else? Or how do we tell ourselves that it's, it's the right move to move forward looking at China, given the situation we're in and this idea that it may last for, uh, for, for some time? It's a good question. Um, honestly, I think I'm too young to answer that question properly. Somebody 30 years older than me would have a much better answer because that's the situation that they would have faced. Um, I mean, assuming again, this is somebody outside China with no prior connection to China, no special in, in other words, um, you know, who's thinking about trying to study this country that's very difficult to access uh, and that's very, very difficult to, to work in. Uh, for a researcher or an academic. Um, I think the best answer I can give is it's always worth it to study China. It's always necessary for somebody to be studying China. You can't ignore this place. Um, it is intrinsically an, an immensely important and interesting part of the world, uh, a major fraction of the world uh, that you know, you can't pretend it isn't there, even though, you know, the U.S. government tried that for a while uh, in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, to some extent, essentially, just pretending the PRC isn't there doesn't really get you very far. Um, and so if you're going to acknowledge that it's there and that it's important, I think it's worth studying. And why shouldn't the person thinking about studying it be somebody to do that? Um, the other thing I would say is that even if you know, field work is shut down for a decade or two decades completely, which it hasn't been, but let's say that it were, and let's say that no data flows in or out really, there's still things you can do, things you can access in libraries. We're talking about Berkeley Library, and Stanford Library, there's a bunch of libraries all over the world with these kinds of resources. They're online things. There's lots of things that can be accessed, excuse me, but that require at least language facility and some sense about sort of history, politics, society, and so forth. So getting that training, I think, is still valuable, even if you end up not being able to use it the way you'd anticipate it. And I had this chat actually a few years ago, now six, seven years ago, actually, with Ezra Vogel, uh, and a, a similar chat about 10 years ago with Victor Falkenheim about sort of what it was like learning about China when you knew that all you could realistically expect to do was go to Argyle Road in Hong Kong and, and, and look at things there and maybe interview people. And they said, well, it was still worth it. It was still so much closer, so much more interesting than what you could get by not doing that. How could you not take advantage of that? And then I would turn around and point not just to the work of those two, which is very, very substantial, but also to uh, Jerome Cohen's book mm -hmm. on criminal law that was, and, and indeed Andrew Walter's book on workers, his first book from, from, from the 80s. Those books were researched entirely based on emigre interviews in mm -hmm. one spot in Hong Kong 
in a sort of very seat of the pants stitched together way, but those remain the seminal works on those topics in the Chinese politics field. Uh, I mean, think of Cohen's book is from 1966. You know, and it still is really the most comprehensive and, and in many ways the best book on Chinese criminal law. And he did it all with emigre interviews. So it, it can be useful to study China even when you have to do it obliquely or yeah, partially. I, I, yeah, I think, I, I think that's a, a point that, uh, you know, I, I would really want to underscore um, because that stuff is still, I mean, it still stands. Um, and, uh, you know, it is... Things were even more difficult back then than they are now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we want to look at it objectively, Bill. In the uh, ten minutes or so that we have left, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, channel two questions that may or may not have anything to do with one another, but they're really good questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so um, I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll um, communicate them to you one uh, one at a time. So the first is. Uh, could you speak more on how you identify similarities and differences in assessing cases to see how appropriate a comparison would be? Are there principles or political factors that you specifically look for, uh, uh, particularly looking at subnational cases uh, uh, across two or more countries? Mm -hmm. That's one question. I guess that's more on the research and research design part, and the other one is more on the on the write up. Um, uh, the question here is my uh, question is about your writing strategy. As you said, qualitative research produces nuanced and unexpected data, which might be fascinating in itself for China specialists, yet the broader audience in political science are more interested in generalizability of your concepts and theories. I wonder how do you balance between these two goals? Is there an ideal reader when you're writing your books? <laughs> That's, those are both great questions. Yeah, they are. Um, how would I talk about that. The first question, I guess, uh, is easier for me to answer, which is that the only good answer to that is it depends almost entirely on what your research question is and the way that you're trying to formulate it. I don't have one sort of template of saying this makes for a good comparison. This is when you know you can compare these countries or when you can't or how you have to draw up these subnational regions. I think you, you just have to be flexible with that as well. I mean, I think that what we need to do really to do that right is not just go to a few places wherever we've got the contacts or the, or the guanxi as we used to talk about it using that term um, and then try to build out the categories from there but rather try to figure out what are the salient categories for this particular issue question or topic and then once i've got that how am i going to select cases in something of a systematic way not necessarily, oh, I'm going to pick this case off the map and this case off the map there. That's not going to work. You have to follow your contacts and the, and, the, and the opportunity to some extent. But you can be careful about how you draw the units that you're drawing the cases from. And I think you just have to do that in a careful uh, and iterative way as you formulate the research topic and the research design. There's no magic formula to that uh, or, or singular formula that you can stick with all the time. Not magic, but... Uh, sort of old, trusty, reliable formula. It, it, just isn't. It, it has to be kind of ad hoc. The second question about writing up, um, this is always the danger. I feel like there's always the danger of sort of coming in too low or too high on the ladder of abstraction. And the other thing I feel like all of us do too much, and I try to avoid is, uh, but I'm sure I do it just as badly as anybody else, is you know looking at these sort of granular very micro level data, and then just jumping right up to this very high level of abstraction and making hopefully nice, elegant argument about big theory. But the connection between the granular data and the big theory is weak. And these middle levels of abstraction as you move up get skipped, right? You sort of try to jump rungs up the ladder rather than, than climbing carefully. And the careful climb is a long slog and maybe you don't get all the way to the top. And so there's all those problems. But I think that's, that's a major problem in a lot of books, uh, including probably mine, uh, much as I've always tried to avoid that. I'm sure I'm probably still doing that just as badly as I like to point to other people doing it. In terms of an ideal reader, that's a really hard one. I think the best case for that 
and, and I'm sure I've failed at this, but the best case for that when you're looking at cross-national comparison is to try to imagine the specialist of the other country, you know, who's still a comparative politics person, right? So there, all of these people are gonna be interested in the comparative politics theory, right? And, but, but you know, they're also gonna be interested in the granular data about their own country of specialty, right? But why would an Indonesia specialist wanna read the China parts of my book? Why would a China specialist want to read the Indonesia parts of my book? Maybe they don't. And in fact, I had that complaint from at least a couple of people. Why am I reading so much about Indonesia? I thought it was a book about China and vice versa. And maybe they just don't read it as much as they would if they actually saw value in the other part. But my hope or aspiration, which again, I'm sure I've fallen somewhat short of, maybe very far short of, is to actually make it so that that would be interesting still to them that you know, they know that this is granular data about a case that they don't know and normally don't care that much about, but they actually want to read it anyway because it's interesting in the context of the theory and the argument being built in a way that also includes their, their preferred case. Um, and again, yeah, I don't know that I've accomplished that, but I think if I had an ideal reader in mind, it would really be those maybe three sets of readers, those two, plus then somebody that really specializes in the topic, but in a totally different part of the world. So if I'm writing about sort of courts and legal institutions, somebody who studies that in you know, India or Russia or the US, you know, might still find the book interesting and not mind reading through all the granular stuff about China and Indonesia and take out mainly the big picture arguments, but still see the value in it. And then imagine the China specialist who maybe doesn't study law, but reads it and still wants to read the Indonesia bits. And then the Indonesia specialist who still wants to read the China bits. If I can please those three readers, if I imagine the three of them sitting around a table and they all read the whole thing and didn't hate it, I'm really happy, but I'm sure I haven't done that. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's, it's a tough call. I mean, I, with, with my dissertation, I had five people I had to please. So when I started writing books, I was like, you know what, I don't really care. <laughs> you know, because, you know, if enough people think the topic is interesting, mm. then, you know, it, it, it'll find, it'll find its audience, mm -hmm. you know, and I guess you kind of internalize that. But one, one thing I would say uh, to the person asking this question is, I think sometimes we conflate uh, this focus on quantitative uh, research with being like large end studies. Um, and I think there's, you know, there's certainly, uh, you know, any number of, you know, fair to Midland uh, scholars, you know, within, you know, the, the, the method subfield of our, of our discipline, just like anywhere else. Uh, but the people who are at the top of their game, for them, it's really not a question of choosing this particular approach versus another. It is rather, what are the claims that you make based on the research design that you've employed? And if you demonstrate that yeah. you are not going, you know, you're not going beyond what you can do and say based on your research design, uh, it's, it's, it's extraordinary to me how respectful they are to that. Um, yes, I think in broad terms. And the other thing I think that's useful to think about is that in political science right now, we've got two methodological fads that aren't actually covering all the bases, right? We've got kind of experiments slash certain causal inference based ideas that try to get at causality in a very careful and, and clear way, but with very little generalizability or, or even reference to external validity. And then we've got kind of big data that tries to get at these big general patterns that are universal, but with no sense of what the causality is. And I think both people who do those things well should realize that they don't cover all the bases. And if you say, well, I'm not really doing either of those exactly, but what I'm doing is showing you the mechanisms of causality at a very granular level and then building bigger picture concepts around that. I think that can be an argument that should be able to win the day, at least with more careful scholars, even from both of those proclivities. I, I think that's right. At least I'm going to be hopeful that that's right, because I said we'd, we'd end on a, on a hopeful yeah. note. So we've reached our time. Um, Bill, thank you so much. Uh, you. I cannot, uh, I, I cannot even begin to uh, sh uh, show my appreciation because this is something that uh, uh, once it's up on our website, uh, I think it's going to be of tremendous use to many of the people uh, that I think are most vulnerable right now. 
Um, and, um, uh, and it's just great to be able to buttonhole you for 90 minutes, you know. Well, thank uh, you. It's been wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. That's, that's very nice. Thank you for inviting me. Well, to be continued, I want to thank our audience for, uh, you know, for tuning in. And Bill, I want to, you know, thank you once more. And uh, uh, like I said, to be continued. Great. Great. This, this problem is not going to solve itself uh, tomorrow or the next day. So mm. it'll be an ongoing conversation. Great. Thanks. Take care, Bill. Thanks. See you.